Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I have enjoyed uh, the morning session lectures, and uh, I feel that I have nothing new to uh, say for you after all this uh, valuable information. Just uh, Dr. Sunil asked me uh, to tell you something. Uh, why the vestibular system, despite it's considered a sensory modality, is not uh, treated as the other five uh, sensory input. Anybody has any speculation or any answer for this? Simply, the answer, it is yes, it's a sensory uh, modality, which feels the gravity and the head movement. Uh, but it's a subconscious sensation. It is like all other basic vital functions like the respiration, like the heart rate, circulatory centers, it's subconscious. Nobody's aware that his heart is working or no, because that's a basic and vital. Same, nobody will be aware of his vestibular system if sensing in both or doing. Only people get aware of the vestibular system when they feel dizzy or they get vertigo. But yes, it is the sex sense. So I will be talking now to you, to share with you our approach to acute vertigo. Uh, I have a rapid access vertigo. I got a lot of referrals directly from the emergency department. And I have been through all the published literature. And I will share you the uh, best known evidence-based protocols for uh, approach for acute vertigo, for the diagnosis and management. So this is, I think maybe this is the most important slide in my presentation. I think it's highlighted by colleagues, but if you look to the blood supply coming from of the inner ear, you can see it came mainly from the anterior inferior cerebellar artery, which is a branch from the basilar artery. So the blood supply of the inner ear comes from the posterior circulation. So that's why any disorder which can compromise the posterior circulation, it can present with uh, vertigo, dizziness, tinnitus, or hearing loss, sensory neural hearing loss. The uh, uh, inner ear blood supply is in the arteries. They have no collaterals. And uh, some of those arteries, they uh, run or pass through pony canals, sometimes with the spikes. So very sensitive to all kinds of ischemia, very sensitive to hypercoagulable states, and uh, usually uh, um, very sensitive to any kind of vertebrobasilar insufficiency or hypoperfusion. So uh, acute vertigo in emergency room, peripheral vestibular disorders are not correctly diagnosed or managed in the emergency department. Misdiagnosis rates estimated in the range of 74% to 81%. Common disorders such as BBV and vestibular neuritis are frequently confused for one another and for a more serious central causes as a stroke. And these reports come uh, from the United States and Switzerland. Management is non-evidence-based and suboptimal. This also comes from the United States uh, reports. Stroke misdiagnosis appear to be associated preferentially with dizziness and headache presentation. Also reported by Norman Tucker from John Hopkins University. So there must be problems with the diagnosis of acute vertigo. And Johnson Edlo, which is a consultant of emergency medicine, explains that is the problem with diagnosing dizziness is that we are taught and we are teaching the wrong diagnostic paradigm. The traditional paradigm uses symptom quality. You ask your patient, what's your complaint? If you feel a spinning, okay, that's most likely from the ear. If you feel unsteadiness or off balance, that's most probably from the CNS or the brain. If you feel just lightheadedness, that's most probably circulatory or uh, psychogenic. And this, Paradigm was based on uh, a published article which has uh, many methodological fallacies. And it, uh, this is, was, I think, a long time ago, on 1972. I have born in 1972. 
So that's a very old article, but it became a standard practice in many areas of the world. So problems with the diagnosis of acute vertigo, we are taught to ask, what do you mean disease? The patient response to vertigo, lightheadedness, or near faint. Uh, this symptom quality paradigm dates back to research done 45 years ago with serious methodologic flaws. Uh, ah, yes. Uh, interesting research done by Norman Tucker. Uh, when dizzy patients were asked a series of questions about their dizziness type and then re-asked the same questions in a different sequence just 10 minutes later, over 50% of patients changed their dizziness type. Many, many patients simultaneously endorsed multiple disease categories. And in the same study, patients were far more consistent about disease timing and triggers. So um, regarding the terminology, and I like that Dr. Manoj uh, didn't pay a, a lot of attention for what is the type of terminology the patient is describing. This is goes with the most recent evidence. So for the terminology, because there is different between different schools, I do recommend for you to just uh, uh, go for the Parani Society classification of vestibular symptoms towards an international classification of vestibular disorders. Because that makes some consensus from different backgrounds uh, otolaryngology, neuroautology, neurologist, audiologist, physical therapist. So they make some committees and got some uh, standardization or consensus on the terminology. Acute vestibular syndrome. This is uh, a new clinical entity. Uh, the concept is old, but the name is new. So they propose the acute vestibular syndrome and define it as acute onset of persistent continuous dizziness or vertigo in association with nausea or vomiting gait instability, nystagmus and head motion intolerance that lasts 24 hours or more. Uh, and acute vestibular syndrome constitutes 10 to 20% of the emergency department dizziness and 25% of acute vestibular syndrome cases are due to stroke. Most patients with dizziness vertigo from ischemic strokes develop acute vestibular syndrome, but only 20% have focal neurological signs, including the cerebellar signs, the bust pointing finger to finger or finger to nose, where uh, remainders have isolated acute vestibular syndrome. So in our approach to acute vertigo, we use the standard history, uh, examination, and investigations. For history taking, Timing, this is the key. This is what I have shifted to this paradigm a few years back, and um, it works very well in our experience. So first, we look for the timing. If it's acute, if it's episodic or chronic. And acute means something happened in attack. Uh, if one first attack or a major attack, that's acute. If it's recurrent attack, that's episodic. If it's a chronic, uh, it's a chronic, no attacks. And here a nice uh, approach published by the uh, John Hopkins group, uh, David Newman Tucker, and the uh, neurologist from John Hopkins, and Johnson Edlo, uh, an emergency uh, medicine consultant. It's called Titrate. Uh, it's was, uh, published uh, and titled A Novel Approach to Diagnosing Acute Dizziness and Vertigo. So do I, they, uh, they do triage, uh, just uh, screening to classify the patient. Then they ask for timing, triggers, then do targeted examination, and uh, finally testing. So the titrate approach focuses on timing and triggers, not type. Uh, so timing, triggers, and targeted examinations. Uh, so first, they do triage, because if you uh, see patients from emergency department or have been called to go to the emergency department to attend that is a patient. Uh, you have to look to the general medical condition, level of consciousness, uh, cardiac condition, if there is an ECG abnormality, blood pressure abnormality, uh, laboratory and celebratory tests like the blood glucose, sometimes they have hypoglycemia. So first, uh, 
uh, you have to exclude the general medical conditions. Uh, then you look for the timing. Uh, timing narrows the differential diagnosis by classifying the dizziness attack patterns as episodic, acute, or chronic in duration in the history of the present illness. Triggers seek under, an underlying pathophysiologic mechanism by searching for obvious triggers like positional, like uh, exposures, like after a head trauma or uh, ear trauma uh, in the review of the system. So it can be spontaneous. Uh, syndrome or can be triggered syndrome. So first look for the timing, acute, chronic, or episodic, then for the trigger. It happens spontaneously or it's uh, triggered by a position or a trauma or loud sounds or anything. Then targeted examination, differentiate benign versus dangerous causes within a timing trigger category using specific bedside findings, emphasizing the targeted eye movement examination. Choose the best laboratory or imaging test when there is clinically relevant residual uncertainty about a dangerous cause that has not been ruled out. Even in the United States, they don't have the luxury to scan every patient because it's a health insurance system and there is, a, there is a spending control and rules. So, for categorization, first, episodic, which means occurs in recurrent attacks. Uh, so, let's put it in the timing category, episodic. Then we ask for trigger. If it's triggered or spontaneous, so um, if we can have triggered. EVS means evoked vestibular syndrome. Uh, so, such as cases of BBV or sostasis or superior canal dehiscence syndrome. And can be dangerous causes like uh, central positional vertigo, tumor, stenosis of the vertebral artery. Uh, episodic, spontaneous, uh, evoked vestibular syndromes like Meniere's disease and migraine, uh, vestibular paroxysmia or panic attacks. More dangerous causes like the arrhythmia or transient ischemic attacks. Acute, uh, acute triggered vestibular syndrome, like after head trauma or ear surgery or uh, ear trauma, like the perilymphatic fistula cases. Uh, dangerous causes like skull-based temporal bone fractures, vertebral artery dissection, or by drugs like the vestibulotoxic and the antiepileptic drugs. Spontaneous acute vestibular syndrome, like neuritis and labyrinthitis. Dangerous causes, which causes spontaneous acute vestibular syndrome, like posterior circulation stroke, vernix encephalopathy, or multiple sclerosis. Chronic um, can be uh, triggered uh, like from the clinical context, uh, context after a vestibular neuritis or after um, uh, medications or autotoxic medications, uh, which can cause like uh, vestibular hypofunction, causing chronic unsteadiness or chronic dizziness. If chronic uh, dizziness occurs spontaneous, this is sometimes occur with central causes like the cerebellar degeneration or the new entity uh, which is called cannabis. So <clears throat> there is a nice approach for the history, and this is specific for the acute vertigo. There is some other approaches for the chronic vertigo, but this is for the acute vertigo done by a Belgian group from Belgium. It's called so stoned common sense approach to the, to the disease patient. So it's for symptoms. So what are the symptoms? Vertigo, dizziness, nausea, postural instability, falls without syncope, falls with syncope, lightheadedness, rotator or linear sensation, tilt of the vertical slopes, here, drunken feeling, lateral pulsion, to and fro rocking. O for often. How often does it happen? Daily, once or several times a day, uh, weekly, monthly, regular, continuously only once or only during the uh, trigger. And the S for sense, since when do you suffer from this problem, both related to time and circumstance. A day, week, month, a year, a decade ago, after viral illness, a head trauma, medical surgical intervention, a journey on a power train or plane without any clear cause. Trigger, what triggers the complaints and symptoms? What makes them worse, like aggravating factors? Just, this is important. Any vertigo will be aggravated by head movement. But the correct to be put is to be initiated or 
occur with the trigger with changes in the head position. This will be very suggestive of v PPV. But in it is a patient with vertigo, if he moves his head, vertigo got exacerbated or uh, get worse. Uh, autology do experience any uh, concomitant autological symptoms and when uh, do these occur? Like hearing loss, fluctuating tinnitus, oral fullness, hyperacusis, autophonia, draining ear, otalgia before, during, or after the attacks, and between long lasting independent of uh, autological symptoms. Uh, then, and for neurology, do you experience any concomitant neurological symptoms, headache, migraine, uh, current or in the past, face or limb paresthesia, scotoma, visual field deficits, phonophobia, photophobia, numbness, palpitations, hyperventilation, speech problems, deblobia, cervical problems. E for evolution, how it's relieved or how the symptoms ended. Uh, what is the evolution of symptoms? Persistent, improving, worsening, ups and downs. And D for duration, what is the duration of the symptoms? Seconds, minutes, days, and continuously. My good friend, uh, Raymond van de Perg from Maastricht uh, University, uh, makes some modification for this approach. So he um, did some changes, uh, both the symptom third and both since, which is the timing uh, first one. So he wants to overweight the timing characteristics. So it became since, means when, occurrence, how often the attacks, it's a one attack or episodic attack, so it's a chronic. Um, uh, symptoms, vertigo, unsteadiness, dizziness, and the trigger. It has a spontaneous no trigger or triggered by head movement or loud sounds or um, any other trigger. Autological hearing loss, tinnitus. A neurological headache, loss of consciousness, and the deadly D's. And in the next slide, we'll give you the red flags. Uh, in acute vertigo. So what we call the uh, deadly disease. Evolution, how did it evolve? Duration, how long does the uh, disease last? So alerting some symptoms in the patient history of acute vertigo. Deadly disease, dysarthria, diplobia, dysphagia, dysphonia, dysmetria, dyscesia and dullness or mental dullness or drowsiness or any changes in the level of consciousness. And the headache, any sudden or severe sustained headache should raise the red flag sign and should be investigated, especially in cases of acute vertigo. Uh, there is another approach, it's called a test. Uh, it uh, was published by Edlo in 2016. Uh, so at test, he bought associated symptoms. Then he bought timing, uh, triggers, and E is for exam science, and the D testing to confirm the diagnosis. Uh, what he do uh, with the timing, he classifies the patient into episodic, and if episodic, if it's a triggered or non-triggered, so if it's a triggered, that's most probably uh, BBV, if no trigger, and episodic, it's most probably the most common vestibular migraine and Meniere's disease. Then acute persistent, uh, like vestibular neuritis versus a stroke. If there is other neurological deficit, so straightforward stroke. If isolated vestibular syndrome, uh, he applies the HINTS protocol and will explain this protocol in the coming slides. And hence protocol will uh, tell us if this is a stroke or a case of vestibular neuritis. Then chronic or persistent, and he defines that chronic or persistent, which means symptoms uh, last more than one month. Like cases of unresolved acute vestibular neuritis or other neurological symptoms. I is the window to explore the vestibular system. Do you agree or no? I think most of you agree and uh, we have the balance eye, is the name of this uh, system. Uh, so the balance eye, yes, because the eye is the window to explore the vestibular system. Why? Because from eye examination, we can see pathological nystagmus. We do video nystagmography, rotary chair, and head impulse test. We do the oculomotor test to pursue circuit and optokinetic reflex. We look for a skew deviation. 
uh, we can diagnose internuclear ophthalmoplegia and we can check the integrity of the cranial nerves 1, 3, uh, 4, 5, 7 and uh, the vestibular division of the s nerve just by the eye examination. And also we can look for the pupillary autonomic functions like the cases of uh, uh, meiosis uh, and some uh, uh, <coughs> central causes. And also we can look for papilledema or signs of increased intracranial tension. And uh, we have a presentation yesterday uh, about the increased intracranial tension and uh, vertigo. So I is the window to explore the vestibular system. One more thing <coughs> uh, that is, uh, we have vestibulo-ocular reflex and you have vestibulo-spinal reflex. So clinically, for me, uh, I overweight the vestibulo-ocular reflex examination because like when you examine clinically the vestibulo-spinal reflex, oh, the patient can mimic it. Uh, malingering can do, psychogenic can do, but nobody will generate for you uh, spontaneous nystagmus, nobody will uh, generate internuclear ophthalmoplegia. So uh, it's more objective uh, and cannot be uh, uh, mimicked by acting or malingering or functional or psychogenic. So <clears throat> the first protocol was published, it was work done in Germany. And I think uh, in collaboration with the Newman Tucker from John Hopkins, with the German group, including uh, Brandit, Thomas Brandit and uh, Michael Strop. And it was called bedside differentiation of vestibular neuritis from central pseudoneuritis. And this was published in 2008. One year, yes. And, and uh, this is, uh, was the protocol they uh, proposed in this article. They call it the big five protocol. So look for these five examination points. Uh, those can help you to differentiate this as vestibular neuritis or stroke. So they look for gaze evoked nystagmus. And if you have a, a direction changing gaze evoked nystagmus, that goes with central with a sensitivity of 56% and the specificity of 83%. Then they look for saccadic pursuit, which uh, has a sensitivity for the stroke or pseudoneuritis of 88% and the specificity of 80%. Then head thrust test, sensitivity of pseudoneuritis 61%, specificity 92%. Skew deviation, uh, sensitivity for pseudoneuritis is uh, 40%, uh, but it was very specific. Uh, uh, skew deviation has low sensitivity, but 100 specificity for the pseudoneuritis or uh, the stroke according to this uh, article. So when you gather, put all the five signs together, you have improved sensitivity and specificity to detect the central pseudoneuritis up to 92% by clinical examination without using any uh, uh, investigations. Uh, pseudoneuritis cases, uh, they uh, consider like pica infarction, uh, multiple sclerosis plaques, lacunar infarction at the root entry zone of the eighth cranial nerve. Then I think one year later, the John Hopkins group, uh, including uh, George Ketta and uh, Newman Tucker, they are uh, uh, neurologists at the John Hopkins University, they uh, published their article, the HINTS protocol. So HINTS means tips. Uh, HINTS to diagnose a stroke in the acute vestibular syndrome, three-step bedside oculomotor examination, more sensitive than early MRI diffusion weighted imaging. Very attractive uh, uh, article, and I think it get uh, very uh, popular and famous. So what they proposed, hence to infarcts. So uh, H is for head, I for impulse, N for nystagmus, and T for test, S for skew. So the examination includes head impulse, clinical head impulse test, nystagmus, uh, and the test of skew. So their examination components, which is the hence battery, 
includes head impulse, nystagmus, and test of skew. And they propose that uh, from hence to infarct, when you think that it is a central cause or a, a cerebellar infarction. When you have impulse normal, so infarct, so I for impulse, in for normal. So if you have a normal head impulse test, especially in presence of spontaneous nystagmus, so that's most probably uh, a stroke. Or you have fast phase alternating nystagmus, which is the gaze evoked direction changing. If you have this one, that also points to a central origin of the symptoms. Or refixation on cover saccad. You know how we look for skew deviation? We do alternate eye cover test. Either using your hand or using eye occluder. So any positive, any one positive from these three tests uh, would suggest central origin. And they reported 100% sensitivity and 96% specificity for stroke. And this is the head impulse, nystagmus, we look uh, uh, for spontaneous nystagmus or uh, direction fixed or gaze changing uh, nystagmus and the test of skew deviation. But with the replication of the study, they missed some cases of ICA infarction. ICA is anterior inferior cerebellar artery infarction because it gives abnormal head impulse test and the spontaneous uh, direction fixed the spontaneous nystagmus. If you remember my first slide about the blood supply of the inner ear, so you can understand that is because of the ICA infarction, occlusion of the internal uh, auditory artery can be happen. And if you have occlusion of the internal auditory artery, you will have peripheral signs. You will have peripheral signs. You will have a direction fixed spontaneous nystagmus, you have abnormal head impulse test. So, uh, but they observed that those cases of ICA infarction are usually associated with the recent onset or uh, associated with the onset of sensory neural hearing loss. So they added the plus to their protocol and they named it HINTS plus that was published by Saber Tehrani and uh, his colleagues at the John Hopkins, and it's called head impulse because they added the hearing test to uh, their test battery. So any patient presented with acute vestibular syndrome associated with a recent onset sensory neural hearing loss, that suggests uh, a central cause or what we call inner ear stroke, especially from ICA infarction. Then, just a couple of years later, they proposed the same group, they proposed using the computerized video head impulse test in the emergency department. And they call it the IECG. So the ECG diagnosed the myocardial infarction. They proposed that is the video head impulse test uh, also can diagnose the cerebellar infarction. And uh, uh, this is the HINTS plus protocol. <clears throat> so as we mentioned, look for the symptom timing. If it's uh, one major persistent attack, that's acute vestibular syndrome. So uh, if it's associated with other neurological symptoms, uh, it, it will be classified as a definite stroke. Um, especially if non-isolated means it has other neurological deficit and they propose to start thrombolysis uh, if uh, diagnosed early. Just as they do CT uh, to exclude the hemorrhage before lysis, then they do maybe MRI later. If the acute vestibular syndrome associated with other neurological deficit. Uh, and if the acute vestibular syndrome is isolated, which means only vertigo and nystagmus, no other neurological deficit, they apply the HINTS plus protocol. So if the HINTS plus protocol is positive, it depends on the presenting time of the patient. If, the, if before 48 hours, <coughs> after the onset of symptoms, if the patient is stable, they do observation and admit, and they do delayed MRI. 
Uh, and why they delay the MRI? Simply because first, CT brain is useless in acute vertigo, and it's useless in the posterior um, circulation infarcts. Its sensitivity is less than 20%, number one. Number two, uh, MRI early, in the first 48 hours after a posterior fissure uh, stroke can miss up to 20% of the cases. So a clear MRI at the early beginning, if done before 48 hours, is, does not, is not an exclusion of a posterior circulation infarction. So, and this is the rationale. If the patient presented early, less than uh, 48 hours, they just observe and they lay, uh, after 48 hours, they do the MRI. If the patient already presented after 48 hours, they do MRI from the emergency department. Uh, then if the hint is negative uh, with isolated uh, uh, peripheral, with isol isolated acute vestibular syndrome with hints uh, suggestive of peripheral origin, they just treat and discharge, uh, or sometimes just admit for, um, for intravenous fluids because of the vomiting and uh, nausea, or for uh, vestibular rehabilitation. So, the question, uh, when uh, you can send a patient presented to the emergency department with acute vertigo, when you can send him on home safely? So they make this nice abbreviation, Send home on uh, safe. Uh, send him on home safe. So send straight eyes, no skew deviation, no deafness, no new hearing loss on either side. Him, head impulse misses, which means pathological or abnormal head impulse. Unilaterally abnormal horizontal VR in the side opposite the nystagmus first face. Uh, on one way nystagmus, means direction fixed nystagmus, predominantly horizontal, direction fixed in all, in all gaze positions. Home, healthy otic and mastoid exam, uh, barely tympanic membranes, no pimples, bus, perforation, or pain on uh, palpation of the mastoid. Safe, stand alone, which means the patient is able to stand alone without holding to an, another person or object. Face even. Uh, means no facial, facial policy or uh, weakness. Then one more protocol comes from Italy. It's called the standing protocol, which is a four-step bedside algorithm for differential diagnosis of acute vertigo in the emergency department. It was published in 2014 by Italian group. So the standing algorithm uh, includes spontaneous nystagmus, look for spontaneous nystagmus, then look for the direction. If the nystagmus is the direction fixed or direction changing nystagmus. Then head impulse test, then standing. The ability of the patient to stand alone unsupported because um, uh, those with cerebellar infarction, really they cannot stand unsupported. Even the eyes closed, and standing on a firm surface. But the patient with vestibular neuritis, most of the time they can really uh, stand unsupported as if they are on hard surface and opening their eyes. So uh, they do the look for nystagmus using the frenzel glasses or the uh, VNG Googles, and I do even I will not do the standard video nystagmography test, but I use the uh, balance eye system or the video nystagmography at least to look for spontaneous nystagmus or positional nystagmus. So look for the nystagmus with the uh, VNG goggles or uh, forensic glasses if you don't have. If it's positional, the nystagmus, uh, uh, do Dixol Pike. If it's a positive, it will be BV or do McClure Bagnini test for the horizontal canal. And if you got the typical nystagmus, typical nystagmus, that's you can make sure of the diagnosis of uh, BBV. But in cases especially of lateral canal BBV, the abogetropic type, there was um, some reports that it can be associated with the central causes. 
And in our experience, we have few cases which finally figured out to be cerebellar infarction and one case figured out to be multiple sclerosis. So if you have the geotropic types, that's most probably horizontal canal BBV. But if you have the apogeotropic type, you have to rule the central causes. Then, if non-stigmas, but the patient cannot stand. Despite non-stigmas, but the patient cannot, cannot stand. That means definitely a central cause. I like this point in this protocol. So if patient cannot stand, uh, cannot maintain his postural uh, control, um, even in the absence of any nystagmus, uh, that suggests a central cause. Then if you have a spontaneous nystagmus, if it's unidirectional, means direction fixed, do the head impulse test. So if the head impulse test abnormal, that suggests vestibular neuritis. If the heat impulse test is normal or negative, that means suspected central vertigo. Same like heat impulse enhanced protocol. If the spontaneous nystagmus is a polydirectional or it changes its direction with the gaze, that's also suspect central vertigo. So again, uh, Johnson Edlo, he added the examination part to his attest protocol. So uh, he do these five points. He look for ability of the patient to stand or sit unsupported. Because sometimes if you have a patient with acute cerebellar infarction, they cannot sit. They have severe truncal ataxia. Even they cannot sit alone uh, uh, without help. Uh, then uh, look for obvious CNS signs on examination. Uh, then do a head impulse test and see if it's a negative or positive. Then if you have a worrisome nystagmus, yes, even uh, uh, if you don't have the typical nystagmus like of BBV or a typical spontaneous direction fixed spontaneous nystagmus, if you have any suspicion about the nystagmus, it doesn't look typical, it's better to investigate. And there is no harm to label it as a central cause or to label it as it needs uh, to exclude the central causes. Skew deviation, that's almost in most of the literature, uh, suggests central cause. Skew deviation, where the vertical alignments of post pupils are not on the same plane. So if yes to any of these five examination questions, evaluate for posterior circulation stroke, uh, preferably with MRI. If nothing at all, try to diagnose, it could be BBV, it could be neuritis, and treat a specific peripheral cause, uh, known the common ones, uh, well, like Meniere's disease, like neuritis, like uh, BBV. So does the patient have obvious CNS signs? Uh, logic dictates that if other new CNS findings are present in a dizzy patient, then the causative lesion is likely in the CNS. So there is some subtle findings we have to keep in our minds and look for them, like an isochoria, which uh, is a uh, different size between the two pupils, the uh, asymmetrical um, uh, pupil, pupil size. This is also suggested, especially the meiosis, it's sometimes associated with some posterior fossa infarcts, or posterior circulation infarcts. This arthria, this metria, facial hypothesia, pain and the temperature, uh, not uh, touch, especially with uh, lateral medullary syndrome, and the hoarseness of voice. And I remember in one of the cases we diagnosed as lateral medullary syndrome, we asked our phoniatrician colleagues to examine and they documented vocal cord, unilateral vocal cord paralysis. Then after studying all these uh, protocols and getting uh, uh, inspiration from uh, all of them, uh, we tailored our own protocol, which I have been using for the last few years, and we call it the 10 steps examination protocol. So first we look at vital science. Uh, we don't have to miss this. And uh, 
It's not rare, for example, I have seen in my practice many cases, even with acute peripheral vertigo, who develop atrial fibrillation. I have seen uh, this three, four times, cases of uh, peripheral vertigo, but they have, because of the strong autonomic stimulation, they developed atrial fibrillation. So vital signs, the pulse, blood pressure, and sometimes ECG or uh, blood glucose levels uh, are required to be checked. Level of consciousness, any deterioration of level of, level of consciousness or drowsiness um, should be uh, uh, considered as a red flag. Uh, nystagmus, look for if it's a spontaneous or gaze evoked nystagmus. Uh, then we do the dexual bike test, uh, so by neural test for the BBV. Uh, sometimes if I have a doubt, I first do in the sitting position a vertical artery screening test. Despite uh, this test is, uh, has a low clinical sensitivity, uh, but sometimes shows as uh, uh, one of our colleagues today showed uh, in his presentation, sometimes it shows uh, uh, positive and showed some nystagmus. So if the patient is elderly with um, uh, cervical neck problems, sometimes uh, I do first vertebral artery screening before I do the dexal bike test. And sometimes we avoid the overextension. You don't need to do overextension uh, during the examination of dexal pike when you suspect a posterior circulation and farks. Because kinking the neck or overextension that compromise the vertebral arteries and they can make their symptoms or their stroke get worse. Then we do head impulse test. Uh, then we do alternative cover test for skew deviation. Then we look for a smooth pursuit, even clinically you can do. And then we do standing or Romberge test. So at least we get sure if our patient can stand and support it or no. If the patient cannot stand and support it despite his on a firm surface with eyes open, that's most probably uh, a cerebellar infarction. Hearing test, even in your um, you don't have access to geometry. Try the finger rub or tuning fork test, but it's much better you get a, a standard audiometry. Then finally, otoscopy, uh, because sometimes uh, acute otitis media, we have seen this, uh, sometimes associated with acute vestibular syndrome just because of the acute, severe acute otitis media. So, uh, and sometimes you have to look for the uh, herbal vesicles on the oracle, like cases of Ramsey Hunt syndrome or uh, varicella zoster oticus. Treatment of acute vertigo and emetic vestibular suppressants. Avoid prolonged use of vestibular suppressants, um, which can hinder the natural vestibular compensation. We do use the oral steroids in vestibular neuritis, at least for the first five days, and we do believe they uh, enhance recovery and enhance compensation, vestibular compensation as well. So in our experience, we have good results with the uh, five days course of full dose of breathing sloan. Uh, stroke management, if you get a stroke diagnosis, refer to neurology. A specific treatment like if you, if you labeled as BBV or as a Meniere's disease, then vestibular rehabilitation therapy, if you have a stable unilateral uh, legion. Just I want to share you, with you a few cases. So the first case was a 56 years old male with a history of diabetes and hypertension referred to our clinic from neurology department. Presented with acute vertigo of three days duration, nausea, vomiting, 10 times, the vomiting inability to walk, veering towards the right side, no headache, no reported ear symptoms. CT done. Uh, on presentation to the emergency department and was unremarkable. MRI brain done 24 hours later and was unremarkable. Patient was labeled as peripheral vertigo and referred to our vestibular clinic. On examination, there was clear head tilt reaction to the right first. And with fixation only, uh, uh, only weak left beating nystagmus on left gaze, no nystagmus on the right gaze. And under the video goggles, very strong left beating of spontaneous nystagmus, which was suppressed by visual fixation. 
This is inherited concept from the old text books and the old uh, teaching that if the nystagmus got suppressed with the visual fixation, that means it's peripheral. I fully um, uh, argue against this. In our experience, it's not important uh, at all. And having a spontaneous nystagmus which can be suppressed by visual fixation does not exclude the possibility of central origin. Simply because many mechanisms, how the central lesion uh, causes vertigo, it's a through peripheral mechanism. I give you two examples. One patient with eye can function with associated inner ear stroke. The blood supply to the inner ear completely occluded. This is peripheral or central. Pathophysiological, that will give you a peripheral science uh, on examination. In cases of CP angle lesions, acoustic neuroma, for example, or vestibular schwannoma, sometimes the mechanism is completely peripheral. Sometimes the uh, tumor compromises the blood supply to the inner ear. Sometimes it uh, 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 secretes uh, some chemical toxins or uh, some enzymes or something which causes damage to the inner ear. So. Being rigid, it's preferred or central. Don't be that one because in reality, it does not go. So um, in cases of vertebral basilary associated with transient inner ear ischemia, this is preferred or central. So this sharp demarcation is, I do believe it's not very uh, right in most of the cases. Uh, so we need some flexibility in thinking and in management. So. The nystagmus to be being suppressed by visual fixation does not exclude its central origin. And uh, my uh, clinical experience in, agree in agreement with the recently published literature. So this patient has a, a lift beating spontaneous the, the, uh, nystagmus, which was suppressed by visual fixation. Clinical head impulse test for lateral canal was negative in both sides. Patient couldn't stand unsupported with the eyes open. He was about to fall towards the right side. BTA done and revealed asymmetrical high-frequency sensory neural hearing loss, which are more on the right side. And uh, uh, I did the clinical examination, didn't record. But for the audiometry, I have the audiometry. And here was this uh, new onset sensory neural hearing loss in the right side. And uh, he was the father of one of the consultants in my hospital. And despite he did the CT, he did the MRI, I told him, my dear colleague, your father is uh, most probably has a posterior circulation stroke. Please repeat the MRI. And it's uh, done. Uh, and it revealed acute right peripheral medulla oblongata infarction. Although it was referred from the neurology, CT done, uh, MRI done in the first 24 hours. Uh, second case is a 63 diabetes uh, with diabetes hypertension, female patient, uh, mild to moderate unsteadiness of sudden onset, mild to moderate unsteadiness, no vertigo, no spinning of sudden onset and uh, of one month's duration. Uh, and sinusitis was blamed for the symptoms. She has been seen by uh, ANT doctor and he told them that most probably be because she has some sinusitis. So, yes. Okay. So, um, I have seen the patient and I examined. Just look at this uh, nystagmus and give me your input. So, how you describe this uh, nystagmus? Yeah, correct. It's a torsional. Yeah, so here just I want to give you a hint. If the uh, pupil over the eyeball rotates in its place, so that's definitely rotatory. If the uh, eyeball go to the right with the torsion, then come back to the center. Go to the right with torsion, so it will be right uh, torsional. But for pure torsional, like in this case, um, it makes the full torsion in most of the time in place. So that patient has a spontaneous, spontaneous uh, torsional uh, nystagmus. 
I almost get the diagnosis after having spontaneous torsion and nystagmus. I was sure uh, she has uh, uh, most probably uh, central cause and cerebellar stroke. I, I, I did the recording using the Cyclops system. The first video was also recorded by the Cyclops system. I have two in uh, two sites. I uh, work in them. Uh, and I did also the recording and I I was very satisfied with this recording because it gives some ideas. If you look to the slow face velocity, the right eye and the left eye, they're not the same. Uh, so I feel there was some dissociation. Uh, the slow face is going more fast and it has a vertical component, horizontal component. So I guess this is was excellent analysis for the uh, this type of, uh, of nystagmus. Uh, and uh, I think here also there is a right eye and left eye. One is eight, the velocity, and the other is 15. That means the nystagmus is dissociated uh, in both eyes. That's any dissociation points to more central uh, etiology. Then I want to share with you the smooth pursuit. So it's despite the torsional nystagmus, you can see the cog wheel, cog wheel uh, saccades, cog wheel saccades. So again, then again the recording done by Cyclops. You can see here this saccadic intrusions. So again, I have abnormal uh, smooth pursuit. I wouldn't uh, lose this opportunity to, so I, I did more testing. So this is, was a uh, random circuit. If you observe, there is some overshooting in the right. Uh, I believe it's uh, difficult, but if you focus a little, there is later overshooting. So I wanted to get sure, yes, here, this is the overshooting. You can see this one? And, um, this overshoots, you can see here. Huh? The laser is, uh, why it's not working? Uh, pointer, excuse me, the pointer is not working. But you can see this overshoots. So again, that goes with uh, with the central uh, origin. And uh, uh, MRI was done. Yes, MRI was done and uh, it shows uh, a right cerebellar, superior cerebellar peduncle uh, infarction. So it was a case of cerebellar infarction. And despite the presentation was just mild to moderate unsteadiness. Uh, last case, I think I have seen this uh, last week or 10 days ago, I was lucky to diagnose two cases of inferior vestibular neuritis in 10 days time. So uh, she was a 24 years old female presented by acute vestibular syndrome, but not uh, with moderate symptoms, uh, not that severe symptoms. So on examination, uh, there was a spontaneous down peating torsional nystagmus, especially with the vision denied using the VNG goggles. So I did for her the video head impulse system uh, test, and you can see here there was a riot uh, the reduced the view again with with uh, with corrective saccades, and the one you see in the left uh, anterior canal, this is the spontaneous nystagmus. Because the uh, left anterior canal works in pair with the right posterior canal. So in one canal, we got very clear the reduced VR gain and very clear the uh, corrective saccades. And uh, the spontaneous nystagmus showed in the tracing of the left anterior canal. But because uh, vestibular schwannoma, uh, commonly originates from the inferior vestibular division. Uh, so I, I have to do an MRI to exclude uh, the CB angle lesions, especially the schwannoma, because 
before we have seen few cases uh, which show the similar findings and uh, the MRI showed that they are because of vestibular schwannoma because the common uh, origin of vestibular schwannoma is the inferior vestibular division. So sometimes we have abnormal cervical vamps and sometimes you have a normal lateral canal head impulse but sometimes abnormal uh, head impulse test on the posterior uh, canal plane. Then we started the steroid for this patient and uh, really she improved uh, on steroid and uh, customized vestibular rehabilitation. I didn't do any horizontal exercise. It's all vertical and uh, 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 tilt exercise, head movements. So I did the vestibular rehabilitation mainly I focused on the vertical planes because the deficit in the vertical planes so no need to uh, do horizontal uh, VOR uh, exercises or gaze stabilization exercise and she improved uh, over uh, one week. Uh, just uh, there was, I have been taught this. And I remember some conferences attended uh, 15 years ago. It was like uh, 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 a fact. Uh, that is, uh, the conventional wisdom says isolated dizziness is rarely, if ever, transient ischemic attack. Other brain stem symptoms are usually present. And this is dates back to 1975. Uh, uh, conference or guidelines. So people who still stick to this, that if the patient has only vertigo, not associated with, uh, with other neurological deficits, it cannot be austere circulation transient ischemic attack. This is wrong and uh, it's based on a very old uh, publication with uh, doubtful methodological um, approaches. So recently, uh, the uh, Oxfordshire stroke study uh, reported or came to conclusion that transient ischemic attacks preceding the vertebral buzzer insufficiency could present with isolated vertigo or vertigo with associated subtle neurological symptoms. So we have to change this uh, in our thinking because the evidence also is uh, changing. Just one a uh, more practical tip, I have seen many cases with uh, transient ischemic attacks due to uh, posterior circulation insufficiency. They uh, complain of vertigo associated with tinnitus. And I have seen some of them have been treated as Meniere's disease cases for 10 years until finally they developed stroke. So the natural history of the transient ischemic attacks, you have risk factors, age, diabetes, hypertension. Then the attacks over time become more frequent until finally it presents with a stroke. So it's a precursor for a stroke. So, and sometimes associated with tinnitus. And that makes sense because either ischemia to the inner ear, ischemia to the cochlear nuclei in the brainstem or the brainstem, can give the symptom of tinnitus. So not every dizzy patient, uh, his, uh, his attacks uh, associated with tinnitus is Meniere's disease patient. We have to uh, give more time to evaluate our patient. We have to, to keep all this uh, information in our practice. So the take home message, simple clinical tests can be life-saving in cases of acute vestibular syndrome. The clinical acute vertigo protocols, are much more sensitive than CT brain and more sensitive than MRI diffusion weighted imaging in the first 48 hours. Thank you.